NASPAR non-executive chair Ton Forster is joining me in studio. He recently retired from his position and he's going to speak to us about his career and hopefully give us a glimpse at what's to come. Mr. Forsler, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Now, this year, NASPAR celebrated 100 years of existence. And you started out your career with the company in May of 1956. So you've experienced more than half of NASPAR's existence, really. I'm the ancient one now. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the furniture, really. You're telling me. <laughs> Talk to us about being here for, for so long, really. It actually doesn't feel so long. It went by in a whiz because it's the most fascinating job I think there is. I wanted to be a journal all my life, and I started very young at school, writing for two papers, and it just progressed from there. I had a stint of trying at university, but the newspaper call was much stronger. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, my very first stories was done, the copy was sent through on the old Morse code method, and tap, 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 and then you had telexes, and then later on, of course, now it's the internet. So you, I have progressed through almost decades of new technologies. Mm. And it's so much easier today. In the old days, you know, if you had a big story, you had to rush to a ticky box telephone. And sometimes you had to pre-book the one telephone booth. Otherwise, you couldn't get your story through. Of course, nowadays, the journalists sit with their iPads and their cell phones and whatever. they. Even the photographers don't have to have cameras anymore. They sit in the stand and take pictures and send it back from across the world. So it's a totally new ball game. Mm. But in those days, it was exciting. It was hard grafting. And uh, today, you still have to graft, but I think the, the whole modernization of the newsroom has really been one of the wonders of the, the last century. And certainly one of the wonders of your career. But um, I am sure of that. I, I really experienced it and I enjoyed it. It's great to, to experience it. Mm. But of course, our old fogies, you tend to fall behind. <laughs> well, let's fall behind a little bit now and go to 1956. Mm -hmm. You're starting out at Naspars at what is now known as Die Burger or the Die Burger East. Yes. And it wasn't yeah. called that then. No, it was called the Oosterlich, means the light of the east. How it's, lovely. It's in the eastern province, Cape uh, Port Elizabeth. And that's where the paper was started in 1937. And I was uh, at on holiday at that time from Pretoria, where I worked as a lowly civil servant, but always with the yen to become a reporter. And a friend of mine who was the correspondent in my hometown, he went on leave <coughs> and uh, he asked me to locum for him. So I stood in and I wrote one or two stories, which hit the front page, and the editor phoned me from Port Elizabeth and said, would I like to come and have a chat? And that's how it started. That's not bad going, just falling into the job, really. Yeah, and I had a wonderful time because there were two other daily papers in Port Elizabeth, the, the Eastern Province Herald and the Evening Post. And we were in the Jutnag Bureau, three of us, and all three made their mark in journalism later on. The one became a very famous political reporter. They wrote a biography of John Foster, the then Prime Minister. And the other one became an international correspondent, Clive Cowley. So I was in good company. And we swapped stories. <laughs> You're not supposed to do it, but you know, if you picked up something the other way I wanted, and you, you made a deal. And that's how journals work. Now, I may be biased here, but I really do believe that um, being a journalist and being in the media is the most exciting place to be. And during your career, you saw significant political changes in the country and and huge movements that must have been extraordinary to be on the reporting end of that yes i must say it south africa as you know has been turned on its head and you know the massive changes in 1994 but one would ne never have expected it say in the 60s and the 70s as we had the struggle period and the upheavals and that sort of thing and I don't think any one of us really foresaw the day that it would come so suddenly, the breakthrough. Uh, I had the good fortune in my life to become an editor. 
and uh, I'm not bragging, but in 1978 I was editor of, of uh, Bild in Johannesburg. And I wrote a column that the day would come that the NAT government would sit down with the ANC to negotiate the future. And the strips were torn off my back by P.W. Boota and, and his ilk. But I saw that it was a natural progression because they were in discussions then privately with uh, Swapo on the future of Namibia, the Southwest Africa. And I said there's no difference between the two. It's two nationalisms talking to each other. And that came about, so I was vindicated. <laughs> and I'm very happy at the situation now because we could not have gone on as it was then. South Africa would have been unlivable if we hadn't made this big jump into the future. Let's move away from talking mm. about the changes in South Africa to talking about the changes in NASPARS. Uh, NASPARS started out as a firm deeply rooted in paper in newspapers and in books and in magazines. And now we see a huge push towards digital innovation. In fact, mm. that is where the company is going entirely. It must be extraordinary to have experienced that. No, it is, uh, as you say, where we started off in print, that was the only available entity, if you could look at it that way, until television came along. And I was very happy to start pay television in 1984 at the behest of Chris Becker, who, who came to see me, and I tumbled to his suggestion and got the funds from the board. I was then the CEO of NASPAR, and uh, that was the big breakthrough in the sense that we broke the SABC's monopoly. And then, of course, digitization came along, and uh, Chris is a, is a wily and uh, ingenious and clever character, and he saw the future. And it's interesting, at that time, 97, I turned 60, and I was chairman of the uh, CEO and chairman of the board. And uh, I said to the board, my most important job is to choose my successor. And I had Chris in mind. And I said to Chris, you take over. I could have gone on for another three years. I said, you take over because I know nothing about the digital <laughs> age. It's for youngsters. And I'm so right because Chris, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a genius in, in that field. He just saw the gaps and the opportunities and he took it. And that placed NASPAS in an entirely different category, left all the other media companies in this country standing. I'm not boasting, but it's the fact. I think perhaps you can uh, boast. Well, <laughs> today we're active in 133 countries in our centenary uh, when I look back where you started, we're one of the very few companies still standing, but massively stronger than when, when from where we set out, and looking back a decade even. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it was fascinating for me to be associated with that and making these deals in places like China and Russia, you know, my forefathers, I, as I say, they're spinning in their graves because <laughs> it was the yellow peril and the red peril, and, and now we're business associates. So uh, it, it's great that I, I feel very proud that this started in South Africa, in Africa, and we're doing this competitively in the wider world. And we have wonderful people that, that's doing their duties in carrying out and, and holding up the the flag for South Africa. In fact, that was echoed in your goodbye message did to NASPARS. Did you see that? <laughs> I did, of course I did. In fact, I want to read a little bit mm -hmm. of it to you. You say, I leave you with a heavy heart, but also with a light tread. NASPARS and associates are in very good shape. And certainly I think the country and the world knows that NASPARS is doing well. Was it at all intimidating? Is it intimidating being part of the team responsible um, in keeping NASPARS in that very good shape? Well, you're in the big league now, and obviously you've got to run uh, and run faster. But I have full confidence in the team we have. The top management and people supporting them are great. And there's so much natural talent in South Africa. And what was one of the great features to me was that whenever we sent South Africans over to foreign countries, 
in new surroundings, etc. They not only competed strongly or did their job well, they were outperformed the rest. South Africans are damn good people, workers, well qualified and hard working. And uh, it, we can be very proud of their achievements. So I salute the whole team of NASPERS in all its entirety. It was great to be part of that. In fact, I think we should put that on a t-shirt. South Africans are damn good people. <laughs> well, I can tell you stories like Kuss, for instance, you know, starting out in a place in Holland, he would call a meeting on a Sunday afternoon. And then there was a lot of jibbing from his Dutch colleagues saying, you know, we're on the weekend. <laughs> so he didn't know weekends. If they wanted to work, they had to work. And that's the ethic, you see. And it's still the same. We, I've never seen so much hardworking people. You, you mustn't think that the success we, we have just came about. It was good planning, very hard work. Now, I know this is going to be a very difficult mm. question to answer, but looking back at your career at NASPARS, is there mm. a highlight for you, something that you will keep telling people over and over? Well, I. I would say the one or two that I took very lot of much personal satisfaction from was uh, I was editor of Bielt when we were in the fierce press struggle up north in the old Transvaal, Gauteng, where we were up against four other dailies, opponents, and in 90, 1982 we cleaned them up. It's a pity they all folded, but it's just because we uh, just outplayed them. And that was great satisfaction because the struggle lasted from 1965 and uh, it took a long time, but we always knew we had the best papers and the best people. So it made a, gave us a monopoly, which is not what one wants, but that gave me a great satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think another one was the uh, listing of NASPAR on the JSE in 94, I think. Uh, we opened up that day at a certain pr price level, but it gave me great satisfaction that we counted, we made over a thousand millionaires that day. People who had kept NASPAR shares in the, that they inherited from their f grandfathers or fathers, uh, worth almost nothing. And suddenly on that listing, it became something valuable. And that, that was a great move forward. Mr. Forsler, as I speak to you, I'm noticing a common thread, and that's your belief that what you were doing and the people that you were working with throughout your career were the best. Um, that in working at NASPARS, we worked the hardest we could and produced the best we could. Mm. Is that something that you, you look back at um, over your career? I must say that the companionship and the camaraderie that we have at NASPARS, it, it comes a long way. We were at times, we've called ourselves a close-knit family, but we're too big to be a family now. But even wherever I go with the board, for instance, to different countries, we go into an environment that is friendly and, and full of companionship as part of NASPARS. People are proud to be associated, and that gave me a lot of warmth. Uh, there, there's very little backstabbing as I put it in such a way. And, and NASPAS is truly a great company. There's a spirit in the company that I hope would obviously last for another 100 years. Finally, before I let you go, you know that I, I cannot let you leave without asking you the question we're all wondering, and that's what will you be doing now? Although after, I think, 59 years at <laughs> NASPAS, we won't begrudge you a break. <laughs> Oh, I think I want to sit down and just have a nice quiet break in the sunshine. No, I'm, I won't be entirely uh, uh, unemployable sitting on the stoop. I've got one or two charities I'm involved with. Uh, one of my lovely ones is called Eselkis Ris. I don't know if the translation of that would be the donkey, I've, uh, I've got a name, I'm forgetting it now, but they, it's a Caring a lot of people in the McGregor village where they take in donkeys that have had a tough time in life and have been mistreated and so on. And they 
look after them, bring them back to health and that sort of thing. I think it, donkeys are the most precious animals in the world and you have to have sympathy in your heart for them. So I, I give some of my attention to that and then to music, serious music. I'm involved, I have been with the Cape Philharmonic. And the other thing is, I have something in me, I'm going to write my story. I think <laughs> I'm uh, immodest, and I'm probably a fool in saying it, but I'd like to put down the story of the transformation of Nasper, from what it was, through apartheid and all that, and today, a, I think, a proud South African business that reaches out across the globe. Well, Mr. Forstler, I hope you know that you've said that on camera now, so <laughs> we're going to hold you to it. Probably have to eat my words. <laughs> I hope not. We so look yeah. forward to reading that one day, and thank you so much for speaking to us. Great pleasure.